seminar of this event this semester. We had a few meetings at this time slot uh, in the last few weeks, and, and now we're on to our seminar series. And we have seminars scheduled, uh, I think, most weeks for the rest of the semester. So I look forward to seeing everyone. I also want to remind everyone that we're doing MVZ Coffee back in person Wednesdays at 10. Uh, most of you have been there. Many of you have been there. It's nice to be back in person. We're all enjoying that. A few upcoming seminar announcements. The Energy Resource Group Colloquium uh, is today at four. Uh, Peter Cornish uh, and Matt Goodman, both from Berkeley, are giving a talk uh, entitled Recentering for Climate Justice and, and Healing. And I don't have a location for that. That's today at four. ESPM seminar today, also at four. Uh, Jai Wei Wang, a professor uh, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Shanghai, is speaking on hormone induced cell fate reprogramming during plant regeneration. IB seminar tomorrow at 12 30. Our two graduate students, uh, Jennifer uh, Hoflich and Kelsey Crutchford, uh, Crutchfield uh, Peters, or uh, I don't have titles, I'd be grad students on parade. So that's uh, tomorrow downstairs. Uh, the ESPM Colloquium also tomorrow at 3.30 is Clint Carroll uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and the title is Knowing the Land Cherokee Resurgence and Relational Continuity. Essig Brunch, I've got a whole bunch. <laughs> Harley's making up the lost time. <laughs> Essig Brunch Friday at 10. Uh, James Carey from UC Davis, uh, Insect Biodemography in the 21st Century, Interdisciplinary Perspectives, Emerging Concepts, and Inventive Tools. Uh, the Herbarium Talk and Botany Lunch, Friday at noon, is Seheno Adrian Saralaza. My uh, Apologies if I got that wrong. Uh, from the University of Antananarivo in Madagascar is speaking on the mystery of the sea dispersal of baobabs in Madagascar. So that's her very important uh, Friday at, at noon. Uh, her group next Monday uh, at 6.30 p.m. here is David Enns uh, Minger uh, from San Jose State University. The transgenerational impacts of stress in wild caught lizards. So that's her group Monday at, at 6.30. And then Nikki Lee, a new postdoc in Eileen's lab, is giving MVZ lunch uh, next week. I don't have a title for that. Nikki, is Nikki here? You have a title? Do I have a title? Yeah. Um, what are you going to be talking about? Title, title is, is coming. Uh, I want to introduce uh, a few new people. Nikki was one of them. Eileen, you want to introduce? Uh, Nikki or say anything? She's got her mouth full. Okay, I'll start with Tommy Herrera. Tommy, are you here? Yeah, yeah stand up so everybody can see you. Right so Tommy's a new graduate student uh, in, in my lab. Uh, and he's sitting uh, in the office uh, with Quasi and Sylvia and others at, at the end on this side. Um, and comes to us most recently from Kansas State University, where he did a master's with uh, Andrew Hope. So welcome, Tommy. He's going out trapping this afternoon. Uh, Chris Martin, you want to introduce Alex? Sure. Yeah, Alex Cooper. Okay. As a new graduate of my lab from Texas Tech, with another Chris, Chris Knight, with the office, what kind of exposure to environmental hormones, energy reduction. Welcome, Alex. He's already been All right, I mean, I... Okay. <laughs> Nikki. So Nikki is um, an NSF postdoctoral fellow. She did her doctoral at Smith College under Annalise Spear, who's now on our faculty. It's been a year since she was told you before returning to research. She's going to be working on neuroendocrine mechanisms of dispersal in tissue tissues. Good. Anybody else uh, who anybody would like to introduce or any self introductions? I can yeah. introduce my friend here, Shreya, <laughs> who's visiting. She actually says architecture has been good in the urban ecology. So, 
Super. Thank you, Tyrone, and welcome. I always wanted to meet you. There we go. All right. Uh, yes, uh, Becca. <laughs> okay, any other announcements? Well, it's uh, my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Chris Schell, who's uh, a new, newish professor in ESPM, arrived, I guess, last year, uh, still in the, in the pandemic, uh, and uh, who is interested in becoming an MBZ affiliated faculty member, and we're uh, interested in having him, certainly. Oh. Uh, and uh, uh, before uh, being at ESPM, he was at the University of uh, Washington in Tacoma as an assistant professor. He did his undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago, uh, excuse me, at, at Columbia University and his PhD at the University of Chicago, uh, and then did a postdoc uh, at Colorado State University. Did I get that all right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all jumbled in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, Chris works on uh, wildlife and urban environments, uh, and I was looking at his, his website, and the, the first sentence says he studies the intersections of society, ecology, and evolution. And I thought, well, that's about 10 times as much as I could possibly do. <laughs> uh, but to understand how wildlife are rapidly adapting to life in, in cities, and he's published many interesting papers on this, uh, focusing uh, uh, in large part on carnivores, uh, he had a super interesting review paper in science, I think that was last year, um, looking at uh, how the inequities that exist in, in cities uh, lead to uh, biological effects on, on, on diversity, on ecology, and evolution. And for me, it was a real eye-opener. I enjoyed reading this paper, and it, it, it was things that I hadn't thought about, but like many good uh, bits of science, once you read, you think in retrospect, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so I, I, I really appreciated that. Uh, given his interest in, in vertebrates, he's obviously a good uh, fit to the to the MBZ. And I have a fun fact here, which is, so this is something Carly dug up. Uh, that they were featured on an episode of the Netflix series Explained, talking about friendships between wolves, humans, and dogs. So I thought that sounded pretty interesting. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and today, the title of this talk is The Hunger Games, Exploring the Mechanistic Links Among the Behavior and Physiology in Coyotes. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. So I'm just going to pause and take a moment. Thank you, Michael, for the wonderful introduction, just to say that as a undergrad rising to a graduate student, I was in this room in the like 2008-2009 cycle. <laughs> it was like one of the first like sets of interviews I'd ever done. And I was interviewing to be in Eileen Lacey's lab. I did not ultimately end up coming here, but I think it kind of worked out for the best, right? Cause I'm chilling with y'all now. We giving this seminar, it's the first one of the year, why not? So I, play, I played the long game, I played the long game. Um, so as you probably have already guessed, this talk is gonna be about coyotes. Right, it's in the title, but of course this photo gives it away. Um, I will say just to temper expectations, because I see and hear that there are fellow endocrinologists in here. We aren't going to talk too much about it, <laughs> which sucks because these are all data that are currently being developed. But I will introduce you to a system that's in your own backyard, so in that way you can too start to think about well. Maybe I do want to come to the Rebel Alliance and work in cities. Guess what? You should, because we're talking to community members outside and they are waiting for it. They want it. They want to be able to interface people with wildlife, think about urban conservation and coexistence and what that means in the climate change era. So today I titled the talk, The Hunger Games, Exploring the Mechanistic Links Among Diet, Behavior and Physiology in Coyotes. And you know I have to start with this slide. If y'all have seen me give a slide before, you know where I'm going with this. If it decides that it wants to progress, the tension is palpable. There it is. That's how I told you I deliver, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, some handsome Adonis named Jeff Goldblum, who in the original Jurassic Park movie, which that third Jurassic World actually hit pretty hard. It was great. Um, 
says life finds a way. And this is often an allusion to, yes, dinosaurs finding a way out of these man-made enclosures that we think are really ironclad, but they're pretty much just toothpicks, right? Y'all seen the movie. You have seen the movie. I, that's like a requirement to be an IB is to see Jurassic Park. But we oftentimes think of this not just in say paleoecology, but also in urban environments. In these urban environments that we used to previously think of as these inhospitable landscapes that were not tenable for life other than people and domestic animals and maybe animals that we call pests, which even that can be challenged, right? Because even pigeons have found ways to survive and thrive in these cities. So this is just a small smattering of all of the organisms that have made life in cities, not that they were surrounded by a city and they just had to make it work. But in some instances, they chose to go into cities. And in many instances here in the Bay Area, they are choosing to go into cities driven by climate change affected drought and wildfires. So everything from javelina to the smooth coated otters and everything in between are finding ways to get into these urbanized environments that were previously thought of as inhospitable novel landscapes. And this has spurred a lot of research, so much so that we've started to think about every potential element of the city as a environmental covariate that can influence the way in which a phenotype within the city develops. So much so that we're starting to think about not just the traditional ecological characteristics, right? Predator prey dynamics, population abundance, resources that are available, refugia. We're also starting to think about things like how do socioeconomics shape the landscape? How do building densities influence connectivity corridors? How do noise and light influence the ways in which organisms operate on a daily basis? And today, we really are gonna put the spotlight on food. So understanding how food subsidies, here in particular, anthropogenic food subsidies, and that can run the gamut. It could be quite a bit when we're talking about food, not just garbage, which is what most people think about, but also agriculture, also trees that are grown on the side of homes or lining streets. These are all food subsidies that otherwise wouldn't have existed. So. Just right now, we've already broken some ecological, biblical law that human beings shouldn't be part of the system. That's not the case here, right? We are influential in the way in which the system operates by then flooding a system with food resources that wouldn't have already otherwise been there. So as y'all can imagine, there are quite a few organismal responses to the ways in which these anthropogenic food subsidies shape how these organisms are responding. And yes, many of them are negative. Some are positive, according to the recent studies. So though some are more readily available and abundant year round, right? Many of the benefits to why many wildlife species are ingesting and taking in these food subsidies there are quite a few consequences, everything from compromised immune function to increased pathogen loads, decreased body condition, whether it be size or reproductive health, reliance on nutrient poor food sources, which then means that you're hungry again and again and again and again. Take, for instance, case study. What if y'all ate egg whites with turkey sausage and avocado toast? Compare that to a bowl of Lucky Charms. How hungry are you gonna be after that bowl of Lucky Charms compared to the other breakfast? I may be a little hungry because it's lunchtime, <laughs> right? Not only that, they certainly have a ton of organismal impacts, but they influence community level responses as well. So much so that multiple studies have started to demonstrate that predators are less likely to hunt traditional prey if they have food resources that are offsetting the resources that they normally would get. So for instance, there have been studies in Chicago taking a look at how coyotes will oftentimes spatially and temporally overlap more than you would expect by predator-prey relationships. And that's because these coyotes are being supplemented with everything from berries to hot dogs to the occasional domestic cat. So I did tell you that there were some examples, right? There are some examples where there seem to be positive benefits for these organisms. One of those is the Eastern chipmunk. 
So Lyons et al. did a study where they looked at urban and rural chipmunks and found that the urban individuals not only are ingesting more anthropogenic food subsidies, they have better body condition, which kind of goes against the trend. They have lower fecal glucocorticoid metabolites and they don't have to move as much. Think about how cool that is. And this is oftentimes something that's repeated in the urban literature where you see wildlife move into cities and they constrict their home ranges because they have everything they need within said home range. Sort of like a country kitchen buffet. They're able to get in, they don't have to move nearly as much and they aren't nearly as stressed because they don't have to worry about predators either. Most of the predators are gone. That's another talk for another day. As Michael had alluded to, some of the research we also do in the lab is think about the ways in which systemic oppression influences everything from the organismal to the ecosystem level within a city and everything in between. And part of that is that there aren't as many predators. We'll dig into that for another talk. Now let's get to the negative stuff. Some of the stuff that, in this photo, I should just give a shout out to Zach Hahn, one of our partners in Tacoma, Washington. He works for the Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium. This photo has an interesting story behind it where raccoons, if you go to Point Defiance Park, whenever you're back in the Pacific Northwest, slowly drive 10, 20 miles down one of the roads. You will see one raccoon, then two raccoons, then seven, then at some point, there may be 12 to 15 raccoons around your car waiting for food. And that's in large part because of the fact that people feed these animals on a daily basis, even in front of the signs that say, don't feed the wildlife with the raccoon on the front of the sign. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, as one of my colleagues, Albrecht found that these raccoons that are eating mostly human food subsidies. They're developing hyperglycemia, hypertension and diabetes. I don't know what that says about the American diet, but it ain't good. Similarly, Murray, right? So one of my other colleagues, Murray Murray, does a lot of work on wildlife disease dynamics within cities. And for a certain stint, she had done some work on the American ibis down in Florida, found the same result that the American ibis eating mostly human food subsidies were showing degraded body condition and lower survivorship. She found the same exact thing with coyotes in Edmonton, Alberta, where coyotes were eating, the, the ones that were eating specifically from compost piles were the ones that were developing lower body condition and having higher pathogen loads. So not great. As y'all can imagine, these subsidies also contribute to human wildlife conflict. So when the needs of wildlife and the needs perceived or otherwise of people come at odds with each other. And this can have sometimes injurious or lethal consequences, mostly for the wildlife, but in many instances for the people as well. So this can lead to say wildlife, understanding where the distribution of those resources are, remembering those distributions and then coming back to them regularly so much so that they become more and more tolerant and habituated to people and human activity within an area that then can cause some strife. Now, whether or not that strife is perceived or real is up for debate. We're doing quite a bit of work with a couple of the postdocs and graduate students in the lab, leading some efforts with San Francisco Animal Care and Control right now to take a look at how conflict has changed over the last 10 years. As you probably can imagine, with animals like coyotes and cougars and hawks and bears, folks have their views and perceptions of these animals that then affects their attitudes towards those individual organisms, even if they've never had an experience with those organisms to begin with, which then influences the ways in which we perceive this conflict. So for instance, Bletcher et al. had found that Mountain lions that are in more residential areas that tend to get more human food subsidies also tend to drop more of their riskiness. They aren't as risk averse anymore. So they're starting to hunt inside of residential and suburban areas that can really spell some danger, certainly for domestic pets, if not for the people that live within those environments. That study was done in Santa Cruz. This study right here, looking at kites from Kumar et al in 2019, saw how ritualistic feeding by many of the Muslim members within a city 
influences the ways in which kites then attack individuals. So if you don't feed any of the kites in the area, right? If you don't know that that's part of the culture, the hawks attack you. And then finally, Lamb et al. took a look at how the distribution of trash cans can influence and even result in ecological traps for bears. So oftentimes trash cans that are unsecured tend to be congregated in certain areas of a neighborhood and the bears know it. And then they go for those areas and start opening those trash cans. As you can imagine, this starts a little bit of a behavioral evolutionary arms race where different trash cans are then put in. Maybe there are mechanical lids that the bears have a really hard time opening, but then ultimately what happens is a bear learns how to open up the trash can lid. And then they have cultural transmission of that information through the rest of the population. Then we have to build a better trash can, right? But this all then necessarily requires that we as a community buy in to having a mechanized trash can. And y'all know that trying to get a community together is hard, 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 right? So this is a problem, not just of how do we understand how the wildlife are behaving, but also how do we understand our behavior in order to modify it accordingly. So this brings me to the story. This is, I'm, I'm gonna out myself a little bit, okay? This is the, this is the story that had me go to U Chicago versus come here initially. I heard a story, I love y'all. I, I, I know you know that. <laughs> I had heard a story when I was doing my, my interviews for grad school about a coyote that walked into a Quiznos in downtown Chicago. So here's how the story goes. This was April, 2007 and a coyote, and this is on State Street. If y'all have been to Chicago, you know that State Street is the city. I'm not saying, oh, this is one of the suburbs, like this is Wrigleyville or this is Evanston. No, 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 no. This is State Street, downtown Chicago. Coyote walks into the Quiznos, saunters in, and goes to the drink cooler, jumps into the drink cooler, falls asleep, is there for 45 minutes. <laughs> there are people eating sandwiches. They like do the slow back up. There are people making sandwiches. They do the slow back up. The coyote is in this Quiznos by itself. Now, it created its own refugia by going into a Quiznos. <laughs> I mean, good on you for exploiting a resource that's unexploitable, okay. Um, but eventually they call animal care and control to relocate the animal to the nearest preserve. This, this apparently happens more than we would like to think. And it happens so much so, right? So this is just an example of a coyote chasing a dog, but it fits in line with this pattern that there happens to be something with coyotes. I shared a lot of other examples with y'all about other vertebrates that do some really extraordinary things and then have some not so extraordinary consequences to their own body, right? And yet coyotes are not only finding a way to make it work, but some recent evidence is starting to suggest that they're doing it in stride. Here's the kicker, we talked about conflict. Here's one of those instances and just to show y'all how important this is to our community members, all three of these stories are from the last five years. So there are a bunch of coyotes, particularly in San Francisco and East Bay that have been biting people. And we already know that many of those animals, if they are lethally removed, when we check their stomach contents, they have been eating human food subsidies. So we have a direct link to not only a basic, but also an applied question. There seems to be a lot of human food subsidies in the diets of these urban carnivores. And there seems to be a link between the amount of human food subsidies they ingest and the likelihood of them coming into conflict. I'll share a quick story about that. There was a famous coyote. Some of y'all have been in the Bay Area long enough to know this animal. His name was Carl. Carl the Coyote. If you search Carl the Coyote on YouTube, you will see videos of Carl the Coyote. Please do it. You can, you can even do it now as I'm telling you this story. And Carl was notorious because coyotes oftentimes, they're crepuscular animals. They tend to avoid people almost at all costs, like the plague. Carl was the complete opposite. He decided that he would be out at 1 p.m. 
in the middle of a day in a populated park, just hunting rats whenever he wanted to. Eventually, he would end up biting a few folks that led to his removal. But now we're starting to see the same pattern reemerge today. So the question then remains, is that animal somehow related to Carl? If it is related to Carl, is that animal eating the same foods? For those of y'all that study transgenerational and parental effects, you may be thinking, okay, that's way too rapid for some potential allele to be associated with eating human foods. So maybe the parents are teaching them what to eat. This then underscores all of the reasons why trying to understand the mechanistic links between what the animal eats, how it behaves, and how we're able to coexist is critical. If we can start to break down the pathways by which these animals are becoming more habituated and tolerant, we could break those pathways. Now, again, that's assuming that everybody in the community buys in to we need to do this in order to promote the safety of many in our community, right? Maybe this leads up to policy eventually. We'll talk about that probably in 20 years when I have way more gray hairs and way less hair up here. So the, the larger question that we ask in the lab, again, this is all just preliminary data I'm about to show you. We don't have any of the hormone data yet. It's currently being analyzed. So I hope to share it with you when we do. But the question that guides us is do these dietary shifts impact boldness, impact the very behavior that we oftentimes will see with any animals that are removed from the population because they have hurt somebody, right? If that is in fact the case, what other phenotypic traits are affected? Behavior isn't affected in a vacuum. It's part of a larger system. So what is that system? Well, it may be time to test that age old adage, right? Like, are we in fact what we eat? And that's the question that guides us. Are coyotes in fact what they eat? Is their behavior reflective of what they are ingesting? And that's what leads us to the gut brain access. So of the last few years, we have really been focusing on this gut brain axis, which essentially takes this model to understand how diet influences the gut microbiota within our intestines that then send projections, oftentimes neurotransmitters, right? Neurochemical to our brain about what to do. So imagine that you have a small universe, each of us in our stomachs, and that small universe is dictating your steps. Now, if you're a fan of Westworld, you're like, whatever, this is already a simulation anyway, I don't care. But, <laughs> but if you're a fan of Ant-Man, you're like, this is dope. When do we get our technology, right? When are we able to go in and see what's happening? Well, luckily with many advances in the field, we're able to start unpacking that. We're able to start seeing if we manipulated the diet of certain individuals relative to others, will we start seeing behavioral changes accordingly? And it should be noted that different suites of diets influence different suites of microbiota. So for instance, high fat diet, more firmicutes, more bacterioides, right? We're gonna see more changes depending on the different type of diet that we would have. So imagine a coyote that's eating mostly natural foods, which would be mostly red meat. Compare that to urban individuals that may incorporate some red meat, some fiber it's never really eaten before because everything has corn in it here, to high fat diets. You can imagine that there's going to be quite a bit of reshuffling going on within the gut of those coyotes. And this is a good road to follow, good line of logic, because, well, there's already some prior work done in bird models demonstrating just that, that diet shapes the microbiota and behavior. So some work in Great Tits took a look at how the microbiome may influence its hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, right, the HPA axis, that then influences behavior. There are quite a bit of studies, and y'all can verse me on this, of looking at stress physiology, and behavior in response, right? We know that real, real tight. So how does the microbiome fit into not only boldness behavior, but also things like cognition, the ways in which we make decisions about our world? So if you're interested, Gabriel Davidson was the one who recently did this paper, but it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. So 
here are some parameters for y'all to get set, right? As we play this game of like, are coyotes good? What do we already know? How do we start launching this study? Should be noted that coyotes that feed on anthropogenic foods, which are oftentimes carb rich subsidies, they consume less protein. They have poor health and body condition. They're oftentimes more often involved in conflict. And we already know from a recent study done in 2020 that urban and non-urban individuals have completely different gut microbiome compositions. Sounds good, right? Maybe it's time to do a study. So here are some of the questions that we hope to answer. One of them in particular, I'm gonna show you some preliminary data for. So the first being, does standing variation in gut microbiota predict behavior? One of the current studies that we're doing right now at a captive facility in Millville, Utah, is seeing whether or not there's just general phenotypic variation in the microbiota and whether or not that is related to the behavior of these organisms. Second, do dietary shifts correspond with shifts in boldness behavior? This is the one where I'm gonna show you a little bit of preliminary data from what we've been able to capture over these past two summers. And then really the coup de grace, the, the reason why I'm like giving y'all a little bit so that way you invite me again next year is to talk about this one, right? Are variable diets associated with changes in endocrine function and microbiome composition? To that point, we've been collaborating with a graduate student out at UC Davis who has collected herself along with community members over 600 coyote fecal samples all throughout San Francisco to look at diet, microbiome content, metabarcoding work, the whole nine. But let's get to this one in the middle. Do dietary shifts correspond with shifts in boldness behavior? Well, we have all of our signs. This particular animal right here that you see, you may hear over the audio, the audio is not important. See this coyote, Bernal Heights. If any of y'all have been to Bernal Heights, right? Like lower part of San Francisco County. There's a person that was maybe a few feet away. I'm showing you this video, one, because it's kind of cool that there was a dude 20 feet away. He didn't see the coyote there, had his like AirPods on. I'm like, dude, there's a coyote right there. Um, but two, because this is sort of the basis of one of the behavioral tests that we did. So oftentimes when you'll do a behavioral test, you'll think about like, oh, okay, well, I am going to challenge the animal, but remove myself. Here, we use ourselves as the medium. So one of the behavioral tests I'm about to show you is called a human avoidance or feeding assay, where the animal responds to a person while they're eating. Before I get into that, I wanna show y'all like, yes, we're able to get videos, like the ones I just showed you, right? And camera traps are great for that. They provide a whole host of different opportunities to do some photo ops. I think both Cesar and Tyus are in here, which they are photographed in this. So shout out to both of them for leading many of the camera trap efforts in the lab. But they also give us great resolution and behavior to how the animal is responding in real time. Notice the timestamp on this, 10, 18, 20, 21. So currently we have cameras out in the field recording behavior of these animals as they're moving through the environment. This is at Blake Garden, which you could go to now if you wanted to. It's about 12 minutes north of where we are. And this gives us some indication of how the animals are behaving in space. So if you're curious, right here, you know what? Because I was gifted this, I'm gonna use it. Right here is a fence line. So Blake Garden is a nice green space, but it is also fenced and it's closed at night. However, there's a hole right there. The <laughs> hole is about that big. And this is a full grown coyote moving through that fence line. Just another video, because again, videos of, of these animals is fun and I think everybody should enjoy them. Here is that same individual male right there and his mate moving through four days later. So this is on the Northern edge of Blake Garden. So these cameras are great, but y'all are probably asking yourselves if you study behavioral ecology, you're like, okay, cool but how are you gonna be able to get repeated behavior from known individuals over time? You got me, cameras can't do that. So that's why we have, because some of y'all are like, oh, captive systems, I don't wanna work. No, captive systems in this particular you know, era works because we have different questions that are asked and answered with different methodologies. 
So here, pros and cons for the facility I'm about to talk about, the National Wildlife Research Center, we're able to watch these animals over time, right, and conduct these controlled experiments with diet manipulations. Of course, the difficulty is in fully simulating what that urban environment actually is. Whereas the wild system, which we also have, right? We still have the cameras. We're able to do direct observations of animals that are in direct link to the same covariates that we're so interested in. We can only do so much in a captive environment. But of course the cons are, we're unable to run some of the controlled experiments that allow us to understand our things like personality linked to diet. Okay, so. That is just a big introduction to say, here's the National Wildlife Research Center. It's not the worst place to do research in. This is like nestled in a couple of mountain ranges in Logan, Utah, right? So this is a beautiful joint. You may see here from far away, these small circle areas and lines. These are all holding pins for each of the animals. So they're each about like a 10th of a hectare in size. And the facility at any given point in time has about 100 to 125 animals that we monitor. So just a quick shout out to the folks that were helping lead this effort, Dr. Lauren Santon and Dr. Julie Young, who one is a, a postdoc here, not, I don't think here in the room. The other is an associate professor over at Utah State University. So just to give you a glimpse of what this looks like, right? Here is the enclosure itself. Here's one of the puppies that we measured way back in 2013. You may be asking, well, why is there this weird um, missing patch of hair? We actually shaved the animals in different spots for two reasons. One, to identify them from far away. And two, because we use the hair to look at long-term stress profiles. So the hair for however long it's been growing, mine has only been about a couple of months, some of y'all a couple of years, you probably are gonna be a little scared to see how stressed you've been during the pandemic. I know I have, I have way more white hairs now. Um, so this dude, we loved him. His name, nickname was Cal L because he was Superman. He was straight up fearless. He's only maybe about as far away as Jim is to me right now, right? Really close, but look at the rest of the family. So this is something that we cannot get in an urban system in the wild. We can't look at this behavioral variation where they're all like, Cal, you got this, man. We will hang back here. You do you. Cal, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. So this system then allows us to say, all right, well, what is it about this particular individual animal? As I had mentioned earlier, one of the first questions we had, but I don't have data for you today, the standing variation in behavior also correspond to standing variation in microbiome composition. You have to watch the next movie for that one. Okay, so let's get back to our original question. Do dietary shifts correspond with shifts in boldness behavior? So what we did is we took about 30 coyotes. They were in 15 pairs. And we wanted to do a couple of things. One, we wanted to know, well, what are the stress profiles of these animals? But we don't want to have to collect blood every week that we do this manipulation. How can we do it non-invasively? Y'all probably know where I'm going with this. We use fecal samples, but you may be asking, okay, Chris, you had 30 coyotes and you have 15 pairs. How are you going to distinguish between coyote A and coyote B? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> See that goodness right there? I, I mean, it was lunch. This is making me more hungry. <laughs> Somehow this goodness right here is called mink food. Um, and it is the standard food that the animals are given. And we use this to our advantage. These animals get it every single day. So why don't we use some of the food rations and pair it with other types of food and see if we create different groups of organisms, will they show differences in behavior? So we took this mink food and we combined mink food groups with a carb rich group where we put together brown sugar oatmeal balls for the animals. And you may notice this is very colorful. It's because we use glitter in the samples themselves, in the food. So then that way, when the animal ingests it, about eight to 12 hours later, they poop out green glitter. How cool is that? So then we can say, okay, the male got green and the female got red. And we know who ate what. Now, Anybody who works on coyotes knows that they oftentimes, nine times out of 10, will give you the middle finger. And I say that because you'll do everything you can to prepare this and make it work. And then 
one individual, one, will eat both of the food balls that we give them. Or they'll eat both of the food balls. And then because they're such a nice partner, five minutes later, we'll go and regurgitate it for their, their pair mate, which I don't blame them. That's really cute, but damn it, stop doing it. <laughs> so we had a, a car group, a protein group, where in this protein group, we essentially had it as somewhat of a mechanical control, if you will, right? Because the mink food already is high in protein. What if we gave the coyotes a completely different protein, but it's still high in protein, tuna fish? And then finally, we used our control group was just the normal mink food rations that they get. So here were our, our groups, generally carb group, right? This is our urban simulated group our protein group, and our control group. So what does that poop look like? Just like that, right? So here's the green for the female, the red for the male. This is one of the better days. <laughs> and then we did that behavioral assay I told you all about, right? The one where you saw kind of the person walking with their AirPods, not paying attention to where the animal was. Well, what you see here is an ATV. The ATV is the customary just driving device, right? The automobile that we use to feed all of the animals. The animal care staff will oftentimes load up those buckets of mink food that you see, put them in the back and then just scatter feed, which is where they throw food to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. They call it a day, they go to the next pen and they do that as quickly as they possibly can. Here again, we took what already existed and flipped it on its head. So we said, well, what if we take this particular assay and instead of leaving immediately, we stayed for five minutes. And we did that three times a week and we just sat right there and said, okay, we gave you food. We put it actually not all over the pen, but in the front half of the, excuse me, of the pen. Are you going to eat it? Are you going to eat it when somebody is watching you and staring you in the face? We do fun things with coyotes. <laughs> so we use a couple of measures. Some of the measures I'm going to talk to you today about are just the latency to feed, which tends to be our best measure, right? So the longer it takes for an animal to eat in front of a human observer, the less bold that animal is. And just to give you guys a glimpse of what's happening, and this is a photo, again, shout out to Lauren, who was able to get many of these magnificent photos. This is what it looks like with two adults inside of the pen. That small circle is one of the animals that, as Lauren would say, is currently depositing one of those samples we will eventually collect. So uh, the behavioral assay literally scared the crap out of this animal. So our prediction here would be that carb-rich, carb-fed coyotes should become riskier, right? These are, again, as a reminder, the urban individuals, the ones that are getting the urbanized diet. Not only that, Lauren then suggested, hey, what if we did this feeding assay with a problem solving assay? Makes a ton of sense. Oftentimes what you eat dictates your ability to think through complex problems. And it just so happens that there are really simply simple, easy assays for us to use to test the problem solving ability of these animals. One in particular was this PVC puzzle pipe that you see. So this pipe, as you see a large version of it here, is staked down into the ground. And then there is a rope on the other end of the pipe. And if the animal comes to grab the rope, it will essentially remove the cap of the PVC tube. So then that way the animal can ingest the food reward inside of it. Now, this is something that's been done across the animal kingdom, including in dolphins. And because it wasn't working inside the PowerPoint, I thought it was just good of y'all to see exactly what this looks like. So I brought it up on QuickTime just because I think this is just something else. Again, shout out to Dr. Lawrence Stanton for getting these videos. So you're going to see a couple of different pairs perform different behaviors around how to get this cap off if it decides to play. Oh no. Okay. Well, we'll try next time. You'll see here that like one of the animals is staring straight down at it and is like, am I gonna get it? Am I not gonna get it? The other animal is waiting to see, well, what's gonna happen? I wonder, huh? 
let's let's just take a second and close this. I'll just have to upload the video next time so you guys are able to see it. Okay. So similar to the prediction for our risk assay, we wanted to say, all right, well, we probably predict that similar to those carb fed animals being bolder, riskier, they probably will be less successful because they don't have to be. What's been found in a couple additional studies around this environment is that for say it's in spotted hyenas, spotted hyenas in urban environments tend to be less good at solving problems. And that's in large part because of the amount of effort that they need to spend at getting food. If you have available food resources everywhere and there's this hard puzzle for you to solve, why bother? Just go to the next site and you can get easy food. So here are some of our preliminary results. We actually predicted, again, as a reminder, carb-fed carb coyotes should be riskier. Here's just a reaction norm looking at the mean latency of those animals across the six weeks that we observed them. Between our baseline period, before we did any observations and any diet manipulations. So all of the animals were getting the same diet for the first couple of weeks. And then we started putting them into these different categories. And what we ended up finding is that really there's, there's no consistent trend. It doesn't seem like the control group, the car group, or the protein group are showing any consistency from that baseline period to the testing period. So we're like, all right, well, we're probably going to have to dig into these data a little bit more. But when we turn to the problem-solving assays, what we ended up finding was that these carb-fed coyotes are, in fact, less successful at solving the puzzle. So here on the y-axis is the number of puzzles solved. And then on the x-axis are the different groups. With the carb group being worse at solving these puzzles more consistently than the protein or the control groups. So this is promising, right? Like at least the design in and of itself is starting to show and bear some fruit. So just as a recap, coyotes did not differ in their risk taking across our different groups like we would have expected. So one of the next things that we are going to do is see, well, maybe the behavior didn't vary, but there could certainly be some variation in the gut microbiota or the endocrine system of these animals. And then finally, we saw that carb fed coyotes were less successful at solving these novel puzzle tasks. So it may be that certain behaviors aren't nearly as impacted as others are. And this may give us a sign to say, well, if problem solving behavior is influenced, but boldness isn't, is it maybe an indirect effect? We're changing the diet, changes how likely an animal is to solve a puzzle task. And maybe even how likely an animal is to be habituated and tolerant to somebody or some object that is associated with people. So some of the next steps, just to give you guys a little bit of a, a preview, if you will, for the next episode is learning some lessons, not only from the live organisms and specimen that we're observing, but also from the dead. So we recently just got an NSF grant to take a look at the ways in which environmental health, diet, disease, and socioeconomics influence the likelihood that an animal will be diseased, a likelihood that an animal will have high heavy metal contents, in their liver, a likelihood that that animal may have exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides. And here's where the MVZ and the Cal Academy across the way really play a pivotal role. In getting these roadkill carcasses, we then are able to build a local repository for our urban mammals, and particularly for our urban carnivores. Something that's already been started here by the MVZ and something that can continue on into the future. That then allows us, if you can imagine, right, this animal, we can get quite a bit from the carcass alone. We can get the skulls to look at morphometrics and whether or not differences in skull morphology vary as a function of environmental health and other environmental gradients. We can use tissue for genomic and epigenomic assays. One of those in particular that we're very much interested in is whether or not we start to see variation in DNA methylation as a function of urbanization to diet. 
we can use hair samples, again, similar to the hair samples we use for the coyotes at the captive facility to take a look at long-term stress profiles. We also can take a look at ecto and endoparasite loads and see whether or not animals that are living in the flats of Oakland have different parasite loads relative to those living in Tilden. And then finally, we can use liver tissues and other tissues to look at heavy metal, as well as anticoagulant rodenticide exposures. And all of this gives us a relative view of the health of the animals, as well as the health of the environment. They serve as our bioindicators, and they're just being thrown in the trash. So luckily, animal care and control, both in West Contra Costa and Alameda, as well as San Francisco, all of those counties are organizing with us to be able to collect enough samples, that hopefully we have enough space for, <laughs> to house, that allows us to take, take a look at things like abundance and disease prevalence, right? Or how dietary variation may influence abundance. For instance, we know that coyotes are living in more densely populated populations in urban environments relative to non-urban environments. So now we have the ability to test that with all of our dead buddies. And that gets us to this One Health framework, understanding how humans, animals, and the environment all intimately interact with each other and how those interactions, again, put us at the center of this equation. So I had started this talk talking about, of course, Jeff Goldblum, who's awesome, right? But also urban ecology being a field in which we are intentionally involved in the sauce. We make everything go. So if we understand how we make everything go and we understand the consequences for other organisms outside of that system, it allows us to better our system and better ourselves. And we don't need it because <laughs> ain't, ain't looking pretty for the climate for the next few years. As y'all saw, right? Like changes in climate, even small ones can lead to extraordinary drought, die off of it, organisms that are in fresh and marine systems. And even in that example, it comes to the terrestrial mammals because We've already heard reports of raccoons and coyotes ingesting some of the dead sturgeon that have washed up from Lake Merritt or from different parts of the bay. I bet you we're gonna find some of those chemicals in those carcasses. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people. There are so many folks to acknowledge. Also including, again, big ups to the graduate students and the postdocs that helped make this possible. I am super excited for the future and to have them and us share all we get from all of the work that we're doing. And I will open up for any questions y'all got. I have a bunch that I'll try to roll into one. one yeah. Are the differences between males and females? Two, based on the sounds I hear outside of my house, they live in big social groups. Yeah. So are there social status differences? Um, and my last one is in your um, puzzle solving studies. Yeah. Did you control for total caloric intake? And what about the possibility of the ones in the high carb zip lines? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'll take all of those questions. Number one, there don't seem to be any differences between males and females. No. Um, behaviorally, and at least in the previous studies that we've done, well, on the endocrine side, there don't seem to be many differences except for things like, you know, progesterone and testosterone. There are dramatic differences there. Um, in some instances, we have some of the females that will overly aggress some of the males or vice versa to the point that like they're missing hair from their back haunches. Um, coyotes are vicious to each other. So that's number one. Number two was about groups, right? So group dynamics, do they live in packs? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do, yes. Um, it depends on how much contiguous green space that they have, but certainly up in the Berkeley Hills, oh yeah, they're in groups anywhere from three to 12. 12 has been the largest that we've heard of recorded that was in Chicago, but there have been reports of groups of that size here in the Bay Area. Um, I will say, however, that they aren't always, not every single individual is making noise. So some of y'all may hear coyotes at night, right? You'll hear one howl, then you'll hear a couple others howl, and it feels like all of them are howling. Oftentimes, it's really only three to five individuals of a group of 10. So it's only the ones that tend to be the most dominant are the, the howlers. 
We haven't documented that and actually quantified it across cities, but that would be a dope study. So that's number two. Remind me number three. Number three is if you can swallow the total caloric intake. Yes. Yeah. So we. I just, I just had a lot of sugar. I don't want to that. Right. Yeah. And I think that was so. That was uh, an observation that Lauren had made when she was out there. Was that when she was feeding the animals, they got super lethargic by about week four. None of them wanted to eat their normal food rations. So it should be noted that, and I just to go back a little bit into the story here, when we were giving these animals different diets, it was on top of the food that they were already getting. Now they were rationed down just a little bit by animal care staff because they knew they were going to be supplemented. But even then, the animals were like, I don't want to eat anymore. So they would get food from animal care staff and just be done with it. So yes, food motivation, we tried to control it as much as possible. But after week three, we realized like we probably could have done this study for a week and had been done. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for this wonderful talk. And I wonder that is the tool that you find that in the party projecting group what was less stressed, maybe related to that for some carnivorous mammals has been reported that the genes receptor to taste sugars have been experienced in the hypothetization. So probably for the coyote say sugars is not very attractive yeah. and that's why you are showing these lists. Yeah, and that's a solid point. Um, and that's something that we thought about in the next iteration of this. So one of the upcoming studies that we're doing at the captive facility is to rather than have just carbs for the carb rich diet group, try and simulate a little bit closer to the urban environment by just variation within diet generally. So having a variable diet group where we sometimes give them sugar, sometimes give them high fats, sometimes give them different types of meats, and then have the one control group just get the normal food rations and see if that dichotomy alone has any changes. But I, yeah, I think you're right. Like they weren't, they weren't really filling the uh, brown sugar oatmeal balls, but they love things like that are high in sugar content, that fruit. So strawberries, raspberries, watermelon, they'll tear some watermelon up. You just throw a whole watermelon in there and they destroy it, right? Pineapple. So yeah, we're, we're working on changing that methodology a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was wondering, my first thought when we were discussing first and first and case yep. was the reverse causality of, I would think it would be more likely that animals that were predisposed to be bold through their genetics or what other other factors would be the ones more likely to push farther into the city, uh, try and get at those human resources. Yeah. I wonder if you had any sort of approach to measure that, whether or not you're looking at selection acting on these animals right. trying to be more bold. Yeah, that is the hundred million dollar question yeah. for coyote biologists because there are two main theories of how that's happening. The first is the one that you suggested, right? That bolder individuals are more likely to venture into novel environments to exploit novel food resources. And those are gonna be the ones because they're already bold that the food that they're eating is just making them consistently more bold. The other theory is that you have individuals that were displaced from their home range. And as individuals that weren't dominant, these subordinates had to find some place, but the only place that they could find were these urbanized areas that had more people in them and greater human activity. So then they just had to make it work. And as they made it work, they realized, oh, it's pretty dope out here. So it's one it's one of those two. I'm not entirely sure which of the two it would be. At first, like I vacillate. Five years ago, I thought it was a subordinate hypothesis. I thought like individuals were getting kicked out and then they were just moving into a city. But there have been some case studies here in the Bay Area that completely blow that out of the water. One is one that one of the graduate students that works with us, Tali Caspi, who's out at UC Davis, will tell this story of this female coyote who dispersed out of the city and then came back into the city. And then like street fighters started beating up everybody until it got to the Presidio and said, this is my home. The rest of y'all can kick it and made it work. So would we say that that individual animal is subordinate? Probably not, right? Like it outcompeted all of the other individuals. How to get there 
That's the question. I think it's going to take some combination of collaring efforts, genomic and epigenomic sampling, and some real long-term data analysis. And luckily, my dissertation was on parental effects. I think they're doing this way too fast for it to be something where it's like certain alleles are being selected for. All of the population genetic studies on coyotes so far have all shown neutral evolution. So genetic bottlenecks leading to restricted gene flow and a ton of genetic drift. But once they're there, then they start to have certain traits that make them more successful relative to others. So it's, we, we got some, if you want to come study coyotes, we'll talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to ask to step back a little bit. Coyotes have been in the Bay Area for eons. Yep. They've only become urbanized very recent. Right. So, what's happened in the natural environment that they occupied before they became urbanized? Yeah. Do you know anything about that at all? Yeah, solid question. So a couple of things happened. So it was a convergence of three main factors that contributed to really coyotes becoming urbanized in all of North America and before the end of the century into South America as well. The biggest one being landscape conversion. So changing a landscape where habitats were quite a bit smaller and not as contiguous. And that was due to development, whether housing or otherwise, industrial or agriculture. And oftentimes the prey species that are able to survive in those moderately disturbed habitats are smaller organisms, which the coyotes love. Take that and pair it with the fact that there were tons of hunters and agriculturalists that had sheep, cow, that they were raising that were then being depredated by wolves. So they eradicated the wolves in the 1920s that then led this completely open eco space for coyotes to move as freely as they want to. Wolves are the best antidote to coyotes. Bears, cougars, they don't hold a flame to wolves. Yeah, but I mean, that's I mean, here in the Bay Area. So that wolves have not been- well, Wolves haven't been here for a while, right? For a long, long, long yeah. time. So then what explains the and recent? So, yeah, and so, I mean, I've been here long enough to know and to realize and have studied um, history. Yeah. The, the two main measles carnivore predators in Tilden Park, for example, when I came here were feral cats and gray fox. Neither one of those is much part of that environment today. Right. Red fox moved in about 25 years ago. Yeah. You don't see red fox anymore. And now coyotes have become the dominant. And so that's a, so what is it about the prey base of those diesel carnivores that has resulted in that change? Because still in the park hasn't changed a bit. Yep. Nor has the housing developments along the you know crest. Yeah. The hills are, uh, or the hills adjacent to Silver Park and the whole region of the park. So that's yeah. a, that's the kind of query that I'm thinking about. Yeah, so the historical piece we know, but the more contemporary piece, that's yeah. a harder question yeah. to answer. I'll say that this is not an isolated incident. And so, I mean, because I live up in the in Kensington Hills. Yeah. I live up above Lake Gardens. Yeah. Um, and so it's only been in the last three years that we've seen coyotes on our street just below Tilden Park Yeah. during the pandemic. Why, I thought, because Tilden Park has basically been closed down and the and people occupation of the picnic grounds in Tilden Park is hasn't been happening in the last three right. years. And so that's what kind of keyed me into, that's why we're starting to see coyotes over on uh, in the residential neighborhoods because they don't have that resource that they used to have, yeah. assuming that they had that resource. And, uh, and that historical knowledge follows many other cities I've worked in, Tacoma and Seattle, Washington, Denver and Fort Collins, Colorado, like Chicago, Illinois. They didn't have viable, large coyote populations for years, for decades, it seemed. There were tons of red foxes. There were a larger assortment of other carnivores. And then all of a sudden, oftentimes it's either distemper or the animals are just displaced out, the red foxes are displaced out, and then coyotes move in. It's happened almost cyclically, almost every city I get into, coyotes are like, all right, I'm taking this place over. It's not me, I promise. Uh, but I do think there's something there. What the answer is, not entirely sure, but wow, that would be a good research project, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it'd be great. Yeah. We, you know, we, we should have had your cameras out there for the last 50 years. Uh. <laughs>
Can we, we have a time machine? We got to go back. Good. Well, if cool. there are no more questions, let's thank Chris for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.